All right, thank you for joining us. I want to welcome you to this presentation, how to write an abstract for a conference paper being presented uh, by Dr. Joe Kider. Uh, this presentation is being sponsored by the IBIPSA USA Research Committee uh, in conjunction with the Building Performance Analysis Conference and SimBuild 2022, uh, helping to prepare you uh, if you are writing an abstract uh, for a paper for that conference, or if you're just here to learn about abstract writing in general and uh, helping to you know, get into that uh, you know, area of doing research and publishing it. Uh, so without further ado, I wanna go ahead and welcome Joe Kider. Joe, go ahead. Thank you, Nathaniel, and thank you for the invitation uh, to do this today. Um, as Nathaniel said, I'm Joe Kider, an assistant professor at the School of Modeling, Simulation and Training at the University of Central Florida, where I lead a diverse group of researchers in the Sensible Design Lab. Now, this webinar will dive into what to include in an abstract and title to help other researchers effectively and efficiently understand the context, the research questions, and the finding of your research. Now, primarily we're doing this for uh, 2020 SimBuild, which is co-sponsored by ASHRAE and ABIPSA, but this is kind of a general uh, abstract writing process when you're trying to submit something for a conference or just thinking about how to start that paper writing pro uh, process in general. Um, if you're specifically in for interested in information about uh, Sim Build 2022, uh, I have two websites up here where you can find out more specifics about the conference format, which we'll talk to a little bit about. But in general, every abstract is going to have the same components, no matter what field you're coming from. And if you're really interested in submitting, and we highly encourage you to submit something to SimBuild 2022, the deadline is September 21st. Now, the Program Scientific Committee usually give a little bit of a leeway for a week, and I'll let them talk to you later about that if they want to at additional time. But for right now, the published date is September 21st for those abstracts. Now, Nathaniel came to me a couple of weeks ago, about a week or a half ago, and said, hey, can we do something on abstracts and do it really quickly? And I said, I can pull, try to pull something together really quickly because there are these two great sources that when I was a grad student, I learned from and trying to figure out different processes to write an abstract. One of them is Simon Peyton Jones at Microsoft Research Cambridge. And I have this website up there and he goes into everything in terms of an abstract, in terms to a paper, in terms to a presentation, and in terms of a grant proposal. So if you haven't checked out his stuff, it's absolutely incredible to actually check out. And it's been a great resource for graduate students for at least the last 20 years. Uh, the second is Dr. Stephen Fury from the University of Central Flor Florida. Steve is one of the premier team scientists. So building science is a transdisciplinary problem, meaning it has a lot of different functions from a lot of different disciplines coming together under one big tent. And Steve is one of the foremost researchers in the United States right now, uh, getting funded from everywhere, from the NSF, DARPA, and a lot of different agencies to work on the science of team science. So our learning objectives today are going to be, first, I'm going to discuss while writing, while writing an abstract and building performance, building science is challenging, primarily since our field brings interdisciplinary researchers from architecture to engineering together. We have to be mindful of our different mental representations, disciplinary specific language and methodologies so that we can make a paper that appeals to a lot of different people in our broad community. I'll talk about finding your idea and how to express your content, research question and findings in a reader centric way. Because we wanna put the reader first, whether they're an engineer reading an architect paper, primarily authored or an architect reading an engineering paper, we want them to get a takeaway from that paper so that they can see something that's amazing from those papers. And then I'll close with some parting thoughts on thoughts to remember during your journey about formulating the structure and style of your paper using simplified language and how to get your research idea across in a way um, that's impactful. So our primary goal here is we really wanna create high quality impactful papers. And this is just an example of a past conference and I'll have some links from some of our premier conferences uh, here at Abipsa where you can look back in time to see high quality papers from SimBuild 2020, SimBuild 2018, um, Building Simulation 2019, the international conferences, um, Building Simulation 2021, which just concluded in Bruges, uh, Belgium this year, which was a hybrid conference that was very successful. And you, we want to have these really impactful papers so that we can inspire the next generation of uh, building scientists. So they can understand what are the challenging problems, what are the cool solutions, and what could be at their fingertips uh, to do something with. 
Now, all the papers have a very similar structure and form, and it doesn't matter, again, if you're coming from a journal paper for energy and buildings all the way down to something for these conferences, you're going to have the same sections in all these research papers, and you want to have the same core methodology in presenting your work where it's very clear what your research question is, what your methodology is that you're attacking the problem. If you're doing a case study or you're doing a simulation analysis and what your main results and takeaways actually are for the broader community. Now, this is part of a larger, broader uh, paper writing process. And there's gonna be some more webinars um, coming after mine that's gonna go deeper into presentations and writing papers and a lot of different things. But in general, every paper uh, process goes into this uh, kind of main formulation where you start off with an idea or you are need to do some cool research. Uh, maybe it's given to you but from your advisor. Maybe it's an idea that you formulated on yourself. So you're starting to put together this idea. Now, something, um, Simon uh, recommends is when you first have that core idea, start writing the paper. I know that seems kind of backwards or upside down, but the idea there is it starts to give you a framework of what you need to write and what you need to and where the open gaps are in your research. So, for example, if I was doing a paper on kinetic facades, something I would be uh, trying to think about are what are all the different um, research processes that are out there, what are all the different um, architectural concepts that I could use for this dynamic facade concept. So I'll do a Google Scholar search, I'll look at all the related work, but then as I'm putting it together, I'm going to start thinking about the expected measures, the research mythology that I'm going to actually do. Now, I don't have to have all the answers up front, I clearly don't, but I want to have a good framework that's going to set me up for success in the future. So as you're doing this great research, think about you know writing your abstract even earlier on, I know we're all here because we have a pending deadline to do, but it's just something you want to start in general early on. Just write your idea down on paper. It doesn't matter what it is. You're the only one seeing it, um, but it's good to put that product down on paper so you can understand and iterate on it and revise it in the future. Then you're going to write your abstract and abstracts are going to be reviewed. Uh, you'll get feedback, whether it's a go, no go to write a full paper. Uh, then you'll write a full paper get a set of reviews back for that paper, integrate those reviews. No papers you know, usually accepted outright these days. You always are conditionally accepted with some reviews from your reviewers because there, there's always a reference we forget, something we're just not familiar with. Our field is combinatorially big. So there's just more research out there that they let us know for. We integrate those feedback from the reviewers and then we prepare a camera ready paper um, if it's accepted. And then we present our work at some kind of conference, be it a, uh, sim build or build sim or any one of the great conferences that are out there um, sponsored by Ashbury or Abipsa in one day. So today we're really going to focus on this abstract part. What goes into a good abstract and how do we write a good abstract in general? So digging a little deeper into that, how do we write a good abstract? I first just wanted to present the general theme of the conference where we're trying to do better buildings. And that's just in general, if you're here for this webinar and you're watching this, uh, you're probably interested in building science, building energy performance, building energy modeling. Um, you wanna create better buildings. You wanna create a better built environment. You wanna use less carbon. You wanna support a transition to a greater and greener climate. Um, this is just something that the DOE is very interested in. Researchers are interested in from a variety of disciplines. Uh, but specifically, we're really looking at how to focus uh, the improving the decision making process from early phase design through construction, through operation of the building, through retrofits um, to rebirth, eventually through more operation. And then one day, um, you know, most buildings die at one day. Um, so then how we actually can reclaim a lot of those materials that went into the building to start new buildings um, so we can have a greener low carbon process for the entire life cycle of a particular building. And buildings surround us. I mean, it's just really cool. Everyone probably watching this webinar right now is in a building. It's something that we all have in common. But building better buildings, the real question is, what does that actually mean? It's a complex, wicked problem that is interdisciplinary in focus. The Department of Energy Building Technologies Office defines this in their mission to develop, demonstrate, and accelerate the adoption of cost-effective technologies and techniques, tools and services, that enable high performing, energy efficient, demand flexible residential and commercial buildings. So this is just something that we can define with a lot of keywords. Everywhere from making buildings better can be looking at future weather and climate to improving energy plus, to coming up with the next uh, great thing, next iteration of energy plus, 
to looking at energy equality, access and justice, well-being of occupants, modeling existing buildings and looking at case studies of what worked and what didn't work, modeling the carbon footprint and embodied energy of the building, which is a really hot topic right now, and looking at it on the urban scale, since all buildings are inevitably interconnected. But the takeaway I'm trying to get here for is it's a real interdisciplinary topic. And it really requires a team. So building performance analysis combines the best of architects, all different types of engineers, be it mechanical, civil, structural, material, et cetera, engineer, uh, computer scientists like myself, I'm a trained computer scientist, so I like writing code and simulation um, in my daily life. Physicists looking at different physical properties of buildings. Construction workers are uh, becoming more uh, STEM oriented. So I was telling my friends the other day, you know, 20 years ago, anybody could open up a car. Now a car has more batteries and electronics in there than my computer did 20 years ago. So it's just an insane explosion of things that are going on. But we're working on these transdisciplinary problems. So this is the pivot that I'm trying to make with these abstracts that we have uh, different disciplinary expertise and we're coming together with a problem that's transcending all these different fields. So our papers, when you write them and you think about your abstract at the get-go, are going to have a diverse set of authors that usually come together. So I never work on a paper alone. Um, my graduate students and I always have an architect work in there for subject matter expert, um, a mechanical engineer, because that's something I'm not if we're doing something with computational fluid dynamics. Uh, and their papers that we write, our products at the end of the day, are going to have a diverse set of readers. I really hope that even as a computer scientist, when an architect picks up my paper, they can have a takeaway and understand what I was focusing on, what I was looking at, and they can get something um, coming away from it. So the practitioners in the field can be affected with what we're writing. So it's not just something for our Ivy Towers. Uh, it's something that a diverse set of readers from a variety of different disciplines can come together under one big tent and really get something out of these papers and these processes as we go forward. So building performance analysis in general, uh, first I just wanna quickly present what it means to research across disciplines, because that's something you have to think about when you're writing these abstracts is to make them available to the architect, to the engineer, to the computer scientist, to the physicist. And that's gonna require a, a kind of a novel way of thinking. And I think that's where a lot of papers fail um, that I see when I review them is they're really hyper specific on something and that's great. I'm not um, denying or bashing that. It really pushes the field together. But in general, if you're coming to a conference like building simulation or sim build, you're reading a journal like energy and buildings or building automation and construction, uh, they are coming from a variety of disciplines in the engineering engine, architectural engineering and construction. Uh, discipline. So you'll hear all these different terms from cross-disciplinary, multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary, and transdisciplinary. And if you look at uh, some of these sources that I'll break down for you that uh, Steve has in his team science books, uh, we start to understand what these different uh, words actually mean. So in general, if you're doing something cross-disciplinary, this is where we're all working in our own little um, interdisciplinary silos, and we have our own stuff going on and our own disciplinary specific training. And the research is now becoming cross-disciplinary where I, I saw a cool idea over in architecture, maybe I wanna use it or a cool mythology um, over in engineering. So these science team members contribute their disciplinary expertise collectively to some new knowledge and we're kind of um, loosely coupley getting together. Uh, Multidisciplinary research brings that circle a little closer where it's a more of a collaborative effort, but we're still kind of operating independently. Uh, we're working um, in different disciplines together, each drawing on their own disciplinary knowledge, but they still remain firmly anchored in their core disciplines. Um, you're not kind of coming together to this greater problem that exists. Interdisciplinary is what you hear used a lot. Uh, it's integrating knowledge and methods from different disciplines using real synthesis of approaches, meaning I'm a computer scientist, but I might be inspired in using something from the architectural design world in how I actually build my code or design my simulation or product. Uh, this is something we see in a lot of papers at SimBuild and Building Simulation where teams come together or juxtapose different concepts uh, from these different disciplines to really have this broad, cool appearance appeal. And I think that's what really separates papers uh, from a lot of the building simulation 
building performance conferences that I see. We're integrating information, data, techniques, tools from a variety of different worlds to advance this fundamental understanding of building performance, building science, this kind of mythical uh, creature that's ill-defined in any one discipline that kind of straddles over top of all these different disciplines in general. So that leads us to transdisciplinary research, which is what building science actually is, where we build from these discipline specific theories, concepts and methods uh, to produce a problem that's spanning all these uh, different disciplines. So there's a focus on these societal problems. You hear things like low um, carbon, look at the carbon footprint of your building, energy efficiency. Uh, it connotates a research strategy that crosses the discipline to create a holistic approach. And this is what a lot of the papers um, focus on. And when you're looking at your abstract, it's something to think about where you're transcending your discipline to have this broader appeal uh, with a new methodological or conceptual framework uh, that is really going to appeal to a, a variety of um, different people in different disciplines from across the world. Now, just take a seminal paper in the field. So uh, many years ago, I think it's the 20th anniversary, um, Drew Crowley um, put the paper for Energy Plus. Now, this is a cool simulation framework, but it's something that has so greatly affected the field. Everyone from architects to engineers to computer scientists were using and inspiring from this paper. And it's just a cool piece of um, building modeling and simulation um, methodological approach uh, that's personified in software that solves and transcends these different disciplines in a very unique way. And this is kind of when you're writing an abstract, think of uh, what went into some of these seminal papers in our field and try to see what are the main takeaways. And I'll start talking about that later um, in this webinar, but there are the big takeaways that you wanna do, something that's gonna have this transdisciplinary appeal um, in your abstract itself. So a great way to identify your idea or what is actually applicable at these conferences or these journals are to look back in the past. Um, every two years on even years in general, um, ABIPSA USA and ASHRAE tend to have been running um, SimBuild. Um, every other year is the International Conference for Building Simulation. And you can Google Building Simulation 2021, 2019, 2017, or Building Sim 2020, 2018, and just see what papers are published, what topics are interesting, uh, and that will help you calibrate whether the idea you're thinking about um, should be going on to this conference. Um, you know, it's not, it's something more than just uh, an end of semester project. Uh, so it requires more work, it requires more research, it requires a deeper methodology. So you can see the level of work that has gone into these previous papers and you can calibrate, okay, is my idea kind of at this level? Um, do I have results that are kind of uh, pushing the field forward in the way these other papers have done? So I always invite uh, students and authors to go back and look at these past conferences. And there's also a lot of great journals you can look at too. And I just listed a couple here. There's many more. I don't want to be non-inclusive. I put these slides together pretty quickly, but you can look at energy and buildings or building environment, uh, building simulations from Springer, automation and construction. And they're just doing kind of the state of the art work that's going on in our field to just say, okay, is my topic kind of calibrated? Um, in general, it probably is because building simulation, again, is I call a wicked problem in that it has a nebulous boundary. So as our world evolves, as we get different challenges, um, different goals, different posts to go. So, you know, decarbonization by 2030, uh, fully net zero by 2050 or something like this. So as these goal posts get put up, um, we're bringing in new challenges, new problems um, with this ever evolving boundary. So in general, just because it's not there doesn't mean it won't be applicable in the future, but it just use this as a calibration point to see what might be useful for your papers and your ideas. So when you identify this is this topic, what you really want to make sure is you have one clear, I call ping or pop. So you just want that one real pop, uh, clear, sharp idea that your paper's presenting. So maybe it's a great way a dynamic facade is um, helping the well being of your occupants in your building. Maybe it's a new way to accelerate Energy Plus with a GPU to accelerate shading calculations. Um, you may not know exactly what the ping is when you first start researching, but inevitably, as you start getting and formulating your abstract, you want to have a reusable insight that's useful to the reader. So one clear idea that you're able to clearly communicate uh, effectively in your abstract in your paper. If you have lots of ideas, that's great. Don't throw them all in one paper, write lots of papers. Um, 
you know, I'm an academic. I love to write papers. It's just something, you know, I do all my daily life. Don't try to cram 10 ideas into one paper and kind of make it a Frankenstein hodgepodge paper. Um, try to keep your paper to be a very clear, crisp research question where you're looking at a bunch of hypotheses and trying to prove or disprove them. Uh, don't throw 10 or 12 research questions in a single paper. It's just going to dilute your work. You're not going to be able to articulate it clearly, and it's not going to get accepted in the end for a full paper. You want to keep um, in mind that you want to infect your, eye, your reader when you write it. So if you write something, I want to you know, read your abstract and come away and be like, I got to read that paper. In some sense, your abstract is kind of a teaser or a commercial to want to go out and read that full paper. In general, the abstracts are read, you know, I'm just going to throw out a statistic, 50, 100 more times than any time somebody reads your paper. So a lot of times when I'm doing a literature search, First thing I do is I pull up the abstract and I just want to see what the paper is about. So from this process, when you're submitting your paper, remember in the end that abstract is going to be whittled down to something that readers are just going to browse through very quickly. And they want a very uh, clear way to convey the useful and reasonable idea from your paper so that when they read it, that abstract, they're going to be like, I got to read this paper. I got to understand what's going on here. This is such a cool concept. Um, it's such neat what the reader or what the authors are actually doing here. The, the reader is, is engaged into this process. Uh, so the fallacy is, I always tell students when they're trying to work on this early on, you need to have a fantastic idea before you start writing a paper. Um, newsflash, very few of us actually do. I'm not one of them. When I start a paper writing process, I, I'm not like, you know, have ideas that fall down from the head. I'm like, oh, I, I went to the, you know, Simbill 2021. I saw this cool idea presented. I have another way to do this. Let me start writing it down and putting it up on the whiteboard and start pinging um, ideas back and forth with my team, my fellow researchers, uh, with some of my colleagues to see if the idea is, is good or not. Um, often I'll give a scratch talk um, in-house to my grad students and just say, hey, I have this neat idea. And they'll shoot back with me a lot and say, no, Joe, that's been done, you know, in this other paper, you're just not familiar with it or haven't read it yet, or that's never going to work out. Here's why. Um, I often give a quick talk. Um, I keep it in-house. I keep it with a lot of friends. Uh, no matter how weedy or insignificant the idea might seem, test it on an audience, get feedback. Uh, architects, again, try and steal from different disciplines. This is what they do all the time. Uh, they have an idea on how something should look, what the form and shape would it be. Uh, they put it together. They put together a couple iterations of that idea and they get feedback, um, be it inside or from outside from their clients to understand uh, whether it's working or not. It's the same thing we should do with research ideas. Uh, just start writing it. Now, when you get to submission, don't just submit all your junk either. Um, try to weed it out and try to figure out what the best ideas are. So maybe just put one or two forward. Don't put 20 papers forward. You're never going to be able to work on all of them at once. You're going to be stretched too thin. Try to pick out what your best work actually is. And I say, what's high quality? What's impactful? Um, these are wibbly wobbly terms um, and the reviewers will tell you inevitably what's high quality. But if you show a couple people, you show a couple professors, you show a couple practitioners, uh, you show a couple of your friends these papers, they'll give you pretty much feedback whether it's impactful or not, or if it's high quality. They'll just say, no, this is just you know, a semester long project. It's not going to impact the field in any significant way or any measurable way. Maybe it did. Maybe you did something so cool in your semester um, where you had such a novel idea or got such a cool result. It is going to impact the field. I think putting it out there early before submission to your research group, to a couple other key trusted people is a great way. I show my past advisors um, some of my ideas to get feedback from my postdoc advisor and my PhD advisor, any, any trusted circle you have um, to get there. And then I always tell people revise, 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 and then revise it again. Um, don't just submit the first idea you wrote 10 minutes before the deadline. Uh, think now you're, you're, you put a first draft out on paper, maybe today or tonight, uh, based on you know, the one page's extended abstract we'll show you um, in a few minutes. Then put it to bed for two days and then look at it on Thursday and then say, OK, here's uh, what my idea looked like on a couple of days of fresh sleep. Does it make sense? Well, no, maybe it doesn't. Maybe I was had something going on um, with what was going on in my life. I was picking up my kids. Something happened. Uh, the idea makes no sense. It's not clear even to me. Uh, I do that a lot. I try to give myself sometimes a month in between it. I look back and I'm like, what was I talking about? Uh, what was past Joe actually saying? So current, the current me has no idea what I was talking about in the past. So that's a great way to actually look at it. But in general, when I talk about writing this abstract, 
And now this is kind of a template that you'll see for a lot of different paper writing processes is you wanna put the reader first. You wanna take your idea when you're pitching, uh, whether it's a one page abstract or a couple of paragraphs abstract or kind of those three boxes um, that we kind of fill in when we have building simulation is you wanna explain it to somebody, your idea as if you are speaking to them using a whiteboard um, or glass board. Uh, something I love to do is go up to the whiteboard and start putting stuff up there, start putting out my idea, but you wanna tell it uh, as simple as possible uh, when you're doing that. Uh, so you wanna convey the intuition for your idea. What is the topic you're looking at? What is your main research question? Why are you working on it? And what's your main results contributions coming out of it? You don't want somebody reading your paper to guess. If they're guessing what's going on, you failed already. And the earlier you present this, these four questions that I just asked um, and for the information, the better it goes. Because pretty much the unfortunate thing is a lot of us are just inundated with a lot of stuff to read. We start out with the paper and we start reading it very detailed in the beginning, and then we might start trailing off if it becomes not an interesting idea or something happens. Now, I try to read as much as I can. I try to read the whole paper all the time. I'm not you know, speaking necessarily for everybody, but there are a lot of people out there that will just literally stop reading after the abstract if the abstract or introduction is not formulated really well. So you wanna make it clear that you convey the intuition primarily upfront what you're working on and you have the takeaways and contributions there for practitioners and researchers um, upfront. Uh, so the idea here is you're trying to convey it to somebody else. You have a mental representation and that mental representation is always gonna be clear in your head for your idea, but you have to convey it to somebody else um, in probably di different disciplinary specific language so that it appeals to a lot of different people. Um, and if you have these you know, bad readers or poor readers or people just browsing because they have a lot to do and they need to just get a, a takeaway of it, uh, they should get the gist from your abstract and your paper. I, I, I go even a step further if you're writing a paper and abstract, I, and I'll talk about using images. I just want to look at the form and shape of your paper and read your abstract and have a real understanding of what's going on there through the um, figures and um, main contribution bullet points there. So you want to make it as easy for the reader as possible to extract the information. If I'm working too hard at a graph to try to figure out what units it's in, or it's not labeled properly, or I have to turn the paper sideways and zoom in on it uh, when I'm reading it. Uh, it, it just, it, even with electronic things, with using our tablets, it's just, I don't wanna deal with that. Try to make it as easy as possible for the reader because the reader comes first, remember that, when you write your abstracts and you write your papers. Uh, so don't tell about your story. Every research project I've worked on, it's soaked in my blood, sweat, and tears. Um, every grad student had to stay up many nights uh, to work on their project. Uh, we don't really wanna hear about that in your abstract or your paper. We really just wanna know about your question, your methodology, your contributions, and your results. Uh, I wanna know how it's moving the field forward. I wanna know what the takeaways will be for different practitioners. Choose the most direct route to tell your idea. Don't tell it in a kind of roundabout way. You want to really provide um, notes and contexts uh, to your reader so that you can find a way to, to tell these different ideas. And I like to talk about uh, the way architects kind of solve a problem. So when they're thinking about a problem, they're given a bunch of constraints and you're given a bunch of constraints as well. Uh, so this is one constraint. This is a constraint from SimBuild 2022 where you can log in on uh, using ConfTool, um, usually for any of the conferences, whatever year that you're in, you go to ConfTool, you put in uh, the conference and you'll get an extended abstract, which you're seeing on the left uh, template, uh, be it your paper template, be it your abstract template, be it a bunch of uh, boxes you have to fill in on a particular website. Uh, you could go to these tools, you register, um, you can start putting in your different information for the paper, you start picking what your keywords are so it gets routed to the re reviewers. Uh, but you're first working on that form and shape like an architect. You're, you're trying to see what your constraints are and you're trying to shape your problem and your writing in a way that you're really gonna get that research idea. And it's gonna be rough, um, just like working with form and shape initially um, is, is rough working under these constraints for an architect, but it's going to guide the rest of your paper process or your building construction in general as you go through this early phase design. So uh, in specifically for this, extended abstract, uh, what 
a lot of times we look for is you're, you're clearly articulating your idea. Um, you have one page to do it, keep within that one page um, in this template that you're given, uh, but very clearly state what the problem is. So my idea is this, my research question that I'm looking at it is this, I, that takeaway should be upfront. Uh, why is it a societal problem? Um, you know, decarbonizing the world is a big deal because, or this is gonna lead us towards um, a net zero because. Uh, then you start talking about a little bit about your details. So the sauce of what you're making. What is the methodological approaches? Is it a case study approach? Are you uh, trying to compare uh, different runtimes for some previous papers? Is it a literature analysis where you're putting some kind of taxonomy or ontology to look at the field under a different lens? What is the main um, idea that you're doing in the details of your methodological approach? Uh, quickly with these abstracts, I really want to know what the state of the art actually is. I think that's really helpful to do. And I, this is not a, for an abstract, not a full blown state of the art literature search or literature review. Um, you know, if I'm improving a dynamic facade, I'm going to look at, you know, the, the seminal work, the most cited work and the most related work. So maybe three types of papers and say, you know, my um, paper is different than Jones uh, 2019. Um, because it utilizes memory on the GPU in a different way. Uh, my paper is uh, different than uh, the original Energy Plus work for looking at glare because you know it's it's computationalized on the GPU in, in a different way. So the seminal work, the most recent work, the most impactful work, the most cited work. Um, try to pivot your work on how your work extends the field in some particular way. So uh, look at Google Scholar; it's a great way. Um, web of Science, there's a lot of tools out there to do literature search, but you want to boil it down to um, knowing what you, how you fit in the field um, and try to do that as quickly as possible. And then, you know, what your expected contributions will be, what your expected results are. If you have early results, you can start um, value sending and showing them what they are. Uh, a lot of times when we're early writing these abstracts, we don't know what the end product's going to be. But when you're doing good research, you should know what your expected results are. So if I was measuring computational time for a speed up for something, I'm going to state that like this process will allow me to have better uh, computational time because, you know, why uh, for the abstract, I'm going to improve occupant well-being. Why? Well, here's some cognitive science and psychology to say that um, looking at the whole spectrum of light is going to be beneficial for the well-being of, of people and go into the well standard of what's actually going on. And you're really motivating to me, you know, what I can expect at the end of this paper. Now, I don't expect you to have a precise number. I'm going to speed it up 50 times because you haven't done the experiment yet. But I want to have the takeaway of what your idea is, what your research question is, what hypotheses you're making, uh, what is your methodology to prove or disprove those hypotheses, how it relates to the current state of the art, and what I can, ex what expected measures I can see at the end of the day. So how can I understand what you're trying to show? And if you have results, throw them in there. If not, you know, um, it's not at the end of the world. Uh, I can kind of guess from expected measures what to expect from your paper. So with an abstract, that's not um, necessarily a bad thing, but if you have them, it strengthens your abstracts. Um, so some things to stick away from, uh, stay away from uh, language that's uh, kind of in the vernacular. So don't use uh, text, think something you would text your friend like this WYSIWAD system was really cool. We study its properties with no specific detail. Uh, we've used this WYSIWAD in practice. I mean, that's great um, if you're a practitioner and use something in practice. Um, you wanna understand um, something a little deeper when you're writing these abstracts. So try to keep it as simple as possible, but be insightful and impactful of what you're looking at. So if you're looking at um, the syntax and semantics, of a facade design. So maybe you're linking it to space syntax um, somehow to understand um, the different uh, ISO views um, and different things going on. Uh, you wanna show how it improves what specific properties you're looking at. I'm looking at improving comfort and increasing energy performance of the building. So you're specific but clear of what you're actually looking for. What are your expected measures? Not we study its properties. I don't know what that actually means. Um, and when you say you're used to it in practice, how did you use it in practice? It's okay to have case studies and compare different buildings. Um, if, it's, if it's moving the field or showing something that has not been compared or done before, or showing how maybe how a, a facade or an architectural concept happens in many different climate zones across the US. You wanna describe, you have some kind of framework in WYSIWAS or whatever it is 
and how you use it to implement novel facade designs and people in the future could come up with newer um, facade designs and plug it into your system and get cool, interesting results. You might've only compared two or three because it's an eight page conference paper in one or two sites. But in general, I can see how this can generalize or extend uh, to something very clearly in the future. You're providing that clear path um, to go for. I always tell people to use active voice when you write. So when you write these abstracts, um, passive voice is okay and respectable, but in general, um, you don't wanna write things like it can be seen that 34 tests were run. You wanna write it in a little more active way. Um, we can see that we ran 34 tests. We wanted to retain um, these properties. Uh, some older researchers say don't use first person. I'm a little younger of a person. You can integrate first person in, I think occasionally it's a stylistic thing. Uh, be careful about saying my framework or the framework. So if it's an inanimate object, it's probably the and not I or we or first person. Um, so I get annoyed when people don't use first person effectively and they're using first person. So sometimes people tell you to just avoid it in general. In general, try to make and use active voice. If you don't know what that means, um, try to Google it, Look, download a tool called Grammarly. I'm not getting paid by Grammarly. Um, I'm not even being paid to do this, uh, but Grammarly is just a great way to make your writing a little clearer and, and it pushes you to do things in active voice, <clears throat> but it just makes your writing pop a little more. It makes readers want to write it. Again, you are writing for the reader. You're not writing for yourself. And uh, I like to say, you know, throw some images in there. You can get away with throwing an image. I always throw an image in my one page abstract. Um, and there's some great images from conferences of the past. So this is from SimBuild on the left 2020, where they're doing large scale urban modeling uh, of wind and comfort. So you can kind of see that it's doing something on an urban scale uh, for things going on. And this is some great work coming out of Christoph Reinhardt's group up at MIT uh, from Building Simulation 2019, where they were discussing uh, why views in an office space are really important. And I thought this graphic just really broke down what they were looking at, what they were measuring in this paper. Because here's the takeaway, images say a thousand words, so you don't have to. So if you use your images effectively, use your graph effectively, they will say thousands of words, so you don't have to cram everything in there and be unclear. If you have an effective visualization, if you have an effective infographic and effective data visualization, it will describe everything you're looking at in a way so you don't have to cram a thousand words. So a lot of times people say, oh, I don't know how to get everything in this one page. I wanna make two pages, three pages. I try to tell them, go back and think if you can take a paragraph or two and express it as an image and try to make it as clear as possible. Like take uh, Christoph's and a Turin's image there on the right. So it's a great way to express what's going on with views, um, with a hemisphere, uh, you know, a sphere of views. Uh, what are the major aspects they're looking at in this paper? And I can take away with just a quick visual glance, very quickly, very efficiently, and very effectively what's going on um, in this paper, where I don't even have to read the paragraph in, underneath it. I can, but I can just take, get a good takeaway just from this image. So if you can pop an image in there, I think it really will help your abstract. Now, don't make your abstract all full of images because you still have to put some writing to talk about what your contributions are, but try to use images in a way to support and augment what you're saying so you can clearly communicate and articulate your idea. Try to use simple and direct language. Um, don't use more words than you have to. I often see grad students do this where they'll say something, uh, they're tr they'll try to sound scientific um, when they don't need to be. I don't want to read more than I have to. So try to say, instead of saying the object under the study was displaced horizontally, just see the ball, ball move sideways, sweat sideways um, on an annual basis, yearly. Um, I can, if I can say it in one word effectively, I don't need to use four or five. Um, so try to use simple direct language. And when you look at your writing, see if you can simplify it, that's a great way to save space to keep it into a page or those um, couple words or text boxes if you're doing something for uh, building simulation um, or the one page for sim build. Now, just to show you uh, a couple, two case examples in the last couple minutes here. Um, so this is a paper from uh, past for me where I got together with uh, you know, an architect, a cognitive scientist, and we tried to look at a way uh, to blend effective kinetic facades. But the idea here was, can we effectively use a dynamic facade to help improve occupant well-being? So I wanna state that very clearly and effectively up front. That, that's the main thing I'm really trying to look at is how do I, uh, what I'm really doing is, I, you know, dynamic facades are something that's been around for uh, quite a while. I show some of the main ones with this graphic underneath. 
that are some of the top dynamic facades that we're familiar with in the world. Um, but I really want to present first the architectural concepts that I'm going to look at, why I'm inspired by them. I want to look at the psychology of daylighting, how it affects the underlying physiology of a human, why spectral light is better, why views are going to improve well-being, uh, describe my simulation results, and then demonstrate the case study for the couple buildings we used um, down here in Florida and how you could use this framework to affect things of the future. So sometimes I tell people when you're writing this abstract, see if you can bullet list uh, some of these ideas on the side to say, if I read it or I have my wife read it or husband read it or boyfriend, girlfriend, whatever, read it, kid read it, um, they can basically write on the side after reading it what your main research question was and what are some of the, some of the four highlights that you're doing. So you're presenting a concept, you're using um, some kind of underlying um, grounded theory in your approach. You have a strong mythological approach for your simulation and then what your main case study and results actually are. If they can't do that, your abstract's probably not effective. And it's worth that exercise to show it to somebody else to see if they can do this, to have a clear and effective abstract that will help you in the future. Um, you know, this is just another case example. So this is something we did um, in energy and buildings. Uh, so the main takeaway here was, can you provide real-time accurate daylighting tools to architects um, in early phase design for these complex facades? Again, same kind of process. I'm, I'm trying to present the different architectural concepts for the different facade types here. They're, they're both static and dynamic. Um, what the mathematical formulation of daylighting is, this is a little more nuts and bolts of a paper where we're looking at trying to solve the full global illumination approach as opposed to you know, three or four bounces that are in some other products. Um, so you're not getting a full global illumination solution, but we wanna do that in real time, which is the approach of why those other ones aren't doing it. But we wanna do that uh, and make that idea clear and crisp to say, you know, the other approach is very valid. Um, we're not trying to really criticize radiance. Um, using a radiosity approach uh, just has a different niche, a different usage of it. Uh, show it on different case studies and make it very clear of, of what's going on. So if you can express this in one page in, in an abstract, um, you can express this in your introduction uh, to your reader as you write the paper, uh, that will really help people understand what the idea is. So it's more, again, than just some quick idea that you had, you put some real thought process into what's actually going on and how you're actually formulating different things. Okay, so some last thoughts. Make sure you submit by the deadline. Be cognizant of the deadline. Uh, with these deadlines, I kind of joked at the beginning that in general, they always push them back. We don't know if they're actually going to do that or not um, in a year. So I always plan to try to get them in by the, the date stated. Uh, and if I get more time, I'll do another revise on it and maybe show it to some more people. But always try to plan for that first date that you're given. Uh, keep to the length restrictions. Uh, don't narrow the margins. Don't use size six font or something. So if they um, have some guidelines out there, try to follow them. Uh, I just got annoyed recently that we had kind of this internal UCF uh, paper writing process and they gave us a, don't use anything smaller than size 10 font. And everybody was start throwing size six font because they had to get everything in in one page. And I'm like, I can't see or read this. It gets really annoying. Uh, you have to follow the guidelines that are given. And you could go onto the conf tool for your conference to figure out what those guidelines are. On occasion, um, if you can supply supporting evidence, that just helps. So if you have early results, if you have experimental data or written out proof that you want to show of something, why something's better, um, and you can work that in quickly to the abstract, that's great. I don't need a, in, in an abstract, so it's one page with a couple of text boxes and um, build sim is a full breakdown of what's going on. But if you give me the gist, I can say, okay, you know, you're going to put more of the science in the full paper. You're going to, for eight pages, you're going to basically be able to have more room to breathe, um, to espouse your idea. So I understand what's going on, but anything you can give me early uh, would be great um, for that. And always, always, always use a spell checker, use Grammarly. Um, we're in a broad worldwide community. All of our papers are in English a lot of times. So if you're a non-native English speaker, um, there are, Grammarly is a great tool that you can start using to help um, improve your writing, but try to always use uh, somebody that's a native English speaker to help your writing just to make sure your ideas are crisp. Uh, you don't want somebody to have a cognitive bias when they read the, your paper uh, that they're stumbling over the language and they're making an assumption about you. I hate, I hate seeing that. I hate that you have a really smart student, great idea, and then I'm the only person kind of advocating for this paper because everybody else can't get past the choppy writing. Um, sometimes the writing's so bad that we have to 
uh, throw it away. But in general, try to leave enough time to let your paper breathe, to show a couple people, to show them your ideas, to use a spell checker, use Grammarly, so that you're expressing it clearly. You don't want people to get tripped up. Remember, reader first when you're presenting these abstracts and presenting these papers. Um, experts are good, non-experts are better. So if a non-expert can get the gist of your paper, that's awesome. So my wife is a nurse. I show her a lot of the papers that I'm working on and she gives me feedback if she understands the high level gist of what's going on. I'm not gonna expect her to understand the difference between showing the integral uh, for radiosity for, and then showing the integral for Monte Carlo path tracing and showing the integral uh, for some other kind of ray tracing technique and understand why one technique's more effective than the other. She's just saying, okay, your technique is better. It's gonna have these takeaways. This is what a practitioner will get. Because again, we have a big tent in building simulation. Um, if you're writing an engineering paper, you really want to have some takeaways for the architect. Uh, if you're writing an architecture paper, you want to have a ways the engineer um, can take away. Be careful of disciplinary specific language. So something I've noticed a lot is that architects describe properties, something's very shiny. Uh, engineers will describe definitions. Uh, the bidirectional reflectance function of this is uh, has a specular component. Shiny and uh, bidirectional reflectance function with the specular component literally are practically the same thing, um, except for one's describing the properties of something and the other one is using very disciplinary specific language to talk about the mathematical properties of another um, item. Just be careful uh, to avoid disciplinary specific language or scaffold what you mean. So you're either providing the properties of your mathematical definition or you're providing the mathematical definition um, for those other people when you can. And revise, revise, revise what you write. Okay, again, the acknowledgements, because we put this together pretty fast um, based on a kind of a session at the end of building simulation one day. Uh, so I relied on a lot of work here on this slide deck from Simon Peyton Jones and Dr. Stephen Fury. So I wanted to acknowledge them again. And I just want to thank you for letting me talk today. Um, again, I run the Sensible Design Lab. Uh, if you're watching this in the future, I'm always looking for highly motivated grad students uh, from a variety of different disciplines. I don't just pick computer scientists. I often want architects mechanical engineers, civil engineers to work in my team. Uh, we do a lot of work in the BIM environment, uh, doing a lot of uh, LIDAR scanning, laser scanning of buildings, uh, translating that to BIM and running different energy analysis. On here, I do a lot of work with drones, with uh, simulating dynamic facades. So in the future, if you wanna work with my group, I would be happy um, to just pop me an email for that. And with that, I'll take questions for the rest of the time. All right. Thank you, Joe. That's been a, a really interesting and informative presentation. Um, I hope that um, everyone here has, has found it very useful. I know that we have a bunch of questions, so I want to give everyone time to ask those questions. Um, if you have a question, please go ahead and raise your hand um, using the reactions button in your Zoom bar um, or, or chat us and let you know that, let, to let us know that you have a question. Um, and our first question is coming from uh, Jayatika. Can you uh, unmute yourself and ask your question? Hello, everyone. Yes, can hear you. Okay, great. First of all, I would just like to thank you, you know, for the giving better insight on working in, in you know, writing a good abstract for the, for the conference. So my first question is, is it, you know, okay to write methodology part in passive voice? I think that's okay to write it in, in passive voice. Um, my thing about active voice is just be careful and conscious when you're using active versus passive voice. So usually the introduction I write a lot in active voice and the results section, methodological section, uh, because it's kind of happening in the past, sometimes I do fall back into passive voice. Um, most readers probably aren't gonna notice or care. I'm just trying to give you tips to make your paper pop a little more when people read them. So. Don't really focus on that a lot. It's just a technique to keep in the back of your head. Um, and I think it's totally fine if you did that in, in the methodological section or the results section. Okay, great. And lastly, I wanted to ask, as my you know, research is already done, so can I, dive, can I dive, can write my results and conclusion in this extended abstract? So and I think if you value send, um, some of your results and results that you have, to me, you know, if I was reviewing, I, I said on the reviewing side, I'm not on the scientific committee at the moment. Um, when I look at it and I'm reviewing a paper, if the person can relate more results, that helps. Um, you want to accept the abstract. Uh, if they don't have any results, I don't hold that against them if they present what results they're going to show in the future. So if you want to work that in at the end, 
I think that's good, but just make sure that your idea is clear, your methodological approach is clear, and then you can have a little bit about the results, I think, at the end. won't hurt anything. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have a question from Dahlia. Hi, Dahlia. Hi. Yes. Hi, I'm Dahlia Fauzi from Egypt. Uh, thanks for the informative uh, session. Uh, mainly, I want to ask as a, um, a research assistant, I apply for many conferences and um, uh, journals. So uh, I have one type for, for writing. How can I do, differentiate between them? How can I make different abstracts as I'm the same person? Um, how do I differentiate between these many abstracts I write? Should I uh, see different examples? Or should I use different expressions? How can I make it happen? For me, yeah. For, for me, you never want to remember, you never want to send the same idea to multiple conferences. So if you have different ideas and you look at answering the following four questions, um, it's okay to be repetitive in, this, in the structure you use. A lot of my papers, the structure is relatively the same. I'm asking, you know, here's a societal challenge that I'm attacking. Here's my research um, focus and question. Uh, here's how it differentiates itself from other work. And then here's kind of the main uh, takeaways, contributions that I'm doing to the field, my main results of the papers for practitioners and researchers. It's okay to be formulaic when you answer those. So the same paper is answering those same four or five questions. Um, but as you change your different topic, every paper is going to have a different focus. So the answers to those questions will be slightly different. And it's okay that you use the same structure in all your abstracts. That's not bad. You just don't want to have the same idea to different conferences. That's just not acceptable because you have to have one idea to one conference and then maybe you evolve it to a journal. So you have to change the writing and rhetoric um, that, that sometimes happens. Uh, so you know, very often all the paper accepted the building simulation then it'll get evolved to a journal paper. Uh, I have to change the writing so it's a little different. That gets tricky, uh, but in general um, you can, you're adding more work so you're highlighting more of the changes that are happening and things that are the same. Yes, thank you. Right. Please go ahead and raise your hands if you have more questions. We have one coming from Mitra. Um, can you comment on how to write an effective abstract if you're still running your simulation so you don't have results to show yet? Uh, that's a great question. So for me, you're still writing your simulation, but you know what you're measuring at the end of the day. So say I'm trying to speed something up, like let's just take a canonical example that I'm gonna improve the shading system in Energy Plus um, by integrating a GPU approach to do uh, pixel counting or something. So I know I'm gonna measure with my simulation as I write the code, um, I'm gonna have time of Energy Plus now and time of Energy Plus in the future. I know what that comparison is going to be. I don't have the simulation done to make the comparison but I can talk about what my expected measure will be. So I often tell students, um, focus on what your expected measures are, focus on what the research methodology is that you're doing. I know you don't have it implemented yet at the abstract stage of the paper writing process, but you can talk about you know, how you're setting up the framework for that simulation, how you're setting up your model um, for the problem that you're looking at and the expected measures. Like I'm gonna measure speed or well-being, or it's gonna be a human subject study or I'm uh, expressing something else. So the way I tell students is when you don't have the result yet, just focus on the methodological practices for your idea and what those expected measures will actually be at the end of the day. All right, thanks. I wanna give another minute in case um, there are any more questions coming in. Um, while we wait, I wanna thank you again, Joe, for giving this presentation. Uh, I want to remind um, our, everyone who's listening that uh, we will have a series of presentations on various subjects related to, uh, to the building simulation conferences coming up this year as we prepare for uh, BPACs 2022. Um, I see we have a question coming from Hiba. Hiba, go ahead and ask your question. Thank you, Nathaniel. Uh, I'm asking about the publication. Would, uh, would you publish the um, uh, abstracts in... Uh, a journal or paper or proceedings or what? Uh, and uh, what about further uh, publication? Maybe we submit a full paper and uh, it, it's published in a journal or so. Thank you. Um, let me see if I, I'll, I'll stat, take a stab at that question, but I might've misunderstood it. So uh, in general, you know, I try to 
with the research topic, I try to pick the conference or journal that's the best fit. So if it may be something a little more construction-y, I might lean towards automation and construction. If it's something, you know, for me, I constantly can't figure out if I should take this paper and submit it to energy and buildings or building and uh, environments, um, the two Elsevier journals. It's something that we uh, go back and forth on. Uh, a lot of times the paper process works that, you know, you have a cool idea and your conference is good because you're getting in, you're making a presentation. A journal paper in general uh, usually just goes on a shelf a lot of times or, you know, library, but you want to advertise that you have this really cool journal paper that's going to be impactful. So sometimes people write a conference paper for it, or sometimes people take the conference paper and turn it into an extended version for the journal paper. Because if you're like me, eight pages is not enough to tell about your three or four case studies, all the different simulations and science that you've done. You have to, you need more. So uh, a lot of times I'll take a paper from, and I'm, I'm doing this now. I have had a paper at Building Simulation where we looked at an AR system to do, look at uh, designing facades. Well, now we're running the human subject study and once we have that done, I'll probably submit that paper to energy and buildings or automation and construction, uh, depending on what are the results from that human subject study. So you have to worry about what you're doing and then making sure that when you're going from conference to journal, you're still out adding value. You can't just submit the same thing, but usually you're adding 30, 40 um, more percent of work is kind of a, a back of the envelope measure um, for more metrics to, to improve upon that. I don't know if that's helpful. Yes, very helpful. Thank you very much. All right. Uh, I hope this has been helpful to everyone. And uh, if you're watching us on our YouTube channel and you found this presentation useful, please like this video and subscribe to our channel. Uh, this, uh, this series is being put together by the IBEPC USA Research Committee. Uh, if you'd like to get involved in that committee, uh, please email research at ibipsa.us uh, or go to the link that I just pasted into the chat. Uh, on uh, you know, behalf of us at IPPC USA, uh, I want to again thank Joe Kider for this presentation, and we look forward to seeing your work at a future conference. Thank you. It was a great time. Thanks, Joe.